Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. Now, I did leave you to fend for yourself for two days, and for that, I apologise, because confession time... I've just returned from a week in Porto Santo, which is a small island between Madeira and Portugal. Now, before going away, I set out to record enough podcasts to keep you company while I was away. But a few cancellations later meant I only had five in the bag rather than seven. And as you all know, I record and publish an episode daily and also cover a few miles across the world covering tech events. But every now and again, I try to walk away from it all for seven days before my head explodes and just completely relax and unplug from the internet. And of course, I'm not going to get all self-righteous on you here because the reality is while I'm away, I will dip in and out of my emails just to make sure I don't return to 800 unread messages. But it's the closest I get to a digital detox. And man, let me tell you, it worked a treat. My mojo is officially recharged and I'm back. And I'm back here, sat in my podcasting chair where I belong, raring to go again. And also, I need to give a a big thank you to JGM2019, who left a review on Apple Podcasts. And he said, very informative, timely and enjoyable. I say he, I don't know, it could be a he or a she. Whoever you are, JGM2019, thanks for leaving that review. And remember, if you listen on a regular basis and you do enjoy the podcast, please leave a quick review on whatever platform you listen, because it really does help us in that battle against the algorithms. And in other news, remember when I told you I was writing um, an innovation guidebook over the summer months after I was approached by a publisher? Well, good news, Justin, it it has all been completely signed off and I'm just waiting for a release date now. So thanks for your patience around that too. And also, as we approach a thousand episodes, I'm going to try and give that book away free to as many people as I can. As a little thank you for tuning into this podcast every day. But enough of my little catch up. We've got a show to do. Now, as you all know, I love busting myths and learning more about tech stories where you least imagine them. And today I explore another potential cyber attack point in hospitals. And I'm talking about IV pumps. And given recent news that the healthcare industry continues to lead in data breaches and 90% of hospital patients receive an infusion during their stay, I think today's conversation is particularly timely. So George Gray, CTO at Ivenix, joins me on today's podcast to talk about the first ever IV pump to be cleared under the FDA's more stringent guidelines and adopted in 2014 in an attempt to reduce skyrocketing costs associated with infusion related errors, pump recalls and security breaches makes this incredibly exciting for me. So just to give you a sense of how far reaching this is, more than 12 million patients were recently affected by a data breach at the American Medical Collection Agency, along with another 7.7 million LabCorp patients too. Intrigued? Good. Wrap up warm because I'm going to beam your ears all the way to the greater Boston area so you can join me in conversation with George Gray, CTO of Ivenix. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little bit more about who you are and what you do? Sure, Neil. My name is George Gray, and I'm the uh, chief technology officer at a company called Ivenix. And um, Ivenix is a startup that has developed a new type of IV infusion pump, which will deliver all sorts of medications and solutions to the patient. So my job is uh, the best job in the company because I get to lead an R&D team and decide on technologies and what we do. And I also get to talk to our customers um, and our marketing team and, and try to understand what we need to do and try to marry those two worlds together. 
Fantastic. And one of the things that I love to do on this Daily Tech podcast is explore areas that people don't usually associate with technology and actually increase the listeners' awareness on just how much of our lives is being transformed by tech. And this is just one of the reasons why I'm so excited to get you on today. So can you set the scene and talk about some of the equipment in the medical and healthcare world that everyone's familiar with, but is currently hooked up to the internet and they've probably not even thought about? Well, obviously, there are many things that are hooked directly onto the internet, like some of the um, devices uh, or applications that are now running on phones that measure heart rates, things like that. But I can tell you that in the space that I'm in, which is in the hospital, there are many things that are uh, indirectly connected to to the internet, like infusion pumps, patient monitors, the patient's electronic medical record, ventilators, um, anything that you can imagine that is collecting data is usually sending that over some sort of a network, which is obviously um, vulnerable to people getting at that information. And one of the reasons I asked you to set the scene there is because I'm hearing more and more about cyber attack points inside of hospitals. I mean, is that something that you can expand on? Sure. One of the bigger areas that people are talking about today are with electronic medical records, because Essentially, if you think about it, there is so much information about a um, a person in that record. Uh, their billing information, their uh, identifying information, even information about their health, things with, that it's going on with them. Getting to that information is um, really a, a big deal, and uh, there are a lot of attacks being launched at that. And um, to a certain extent, there are also attacks being launched at the devices themselves because uh, these at- these attackers are really holding hospitals uh, at ransom to to fix those issues. So when we, if you're a developer of a device, you have two things to think about. First of all, you could be an attack vector. In other words, they could get into your device, and then from there they could launch other attacks to that electronic medical record. And none of us want to be that. And if you haven't heard stories of that, uh, there's there's been many stories out there of of how uh, these attackers get into stores and other things. And and typically they they go through weak links. They might go through an HVAC system that's on the internet. And once they get into that system, they'll um, they'll hop to the next place and hop to the next place until they get to that location where that information or credit card information is stored. So as a developer of a device that's sitting on a network, you want to make sure that you can protect against attacks and also know when you've been attacked. Um, But also you want to make sure that the device can't be uh, controlled by the attacker, um, mostly because the attacker will usually demand uh, ransomware at that point. So we do a lot to try to protect or separate the uh, the entry points from the operation of the device itself. And one potential cyber attack point in hospitals is IV pumps, which you did mention a few moments ago, which is also something that I suspect listeners have never even thought about. So can you tell me more about the kind of threats and risks in this space? Sure. Um, with an IV pump, if you haven't separated the, the point of entry from the the mechanism itself, the attacker could actually change an infusion rate, therefore, you know, uh, putting that patient at risk, maybe even killing a patient. That's usually the type of things that once they've discovered that they can do that, they will um, send you a ransom email and um, and demand that uh, you, you give them ransom or they'll start to manipulate those pumps. If you've designed your pump right, they can't hop over there and and do that um, level of control remotely. But there are a lot of pumps out there today that um, were developed 20 years ago and never had to deal with this. So in in many ways, they're they're very open to this. Uh, Secondly, as I mentioned, if you get into a device, any device, you can use that as an attack vector to attack something else because, you know, my pump might be uh, trusted by the electronic medical record system because I'm passing it data. And if it trusts me, maybe I can, if I'm a, uh, a virus inside the pump, maybe I can leap over to that uh, electronic medical record and uh, infiltrate it. So those are really the two things that we 
we think about a lot when we're building these systems. And before you came on the podcast today, I did a little bit of research just to better understand the landscape and the kind of problems that you're solving. And I quickly learned that today's IV smart pumps, for the most part, rely on technology that was developed more than a decade ago, or like you said, they're up, up to 20 years ago. But can you tell me yeah. more about your in, this new infusion smart pump and also the story behind it too? Well, we, uh, we started by really looking at the issues that are in the, the marketplace today. And, and a lot of them have to do with uh, patient safety and really getting the nurses to not worry as much about the technology and how the pump works and, and think more about their patients. And we discovered two main things. First of all, pumps today basically use a mechanism called peristaltics, which means that the pump is squeezing on the tube and it's pushing fluid down to the patient. Um, it really doesn't know how much fluid it's pushing. It, that's all calibrated when it's first built. But as you can imagine, anything mechanical can fall out of calibration and can change over time. So um, that was good when, you, when pumps first came out and they were competing against gravity because it's better than just having the drip uh, drip into the patient. But now imagine you have chemotherapies and you have all these drugs that Really, when they get into your system, they uh, cause your body to almost immediately respond. Uh, those are the types of drugs that are being used today. And so you really need a pump that's very accurate and also is delivering it very smoothly. Because if you're just giving bursts of medication, the, the person is going to respond to those bursts if, you know, as they go into their bloodstream. So first, that was the first problem we, we, we solved by building a different type of pump that could measure the fluid and then deliver it very smoothly into the patient. The second thing we recognized is that it, um, when clinicians are delivering medications, there's, there's a lot of things they need to know. They need to know what their uh, previous lab results were. They would need to know what other medications were delivered to the patient. They need to know whether this medication is already delivered or whether this medication is incompatible with another medication being delivered. Um, there's many things that if the clinician had this at their fingertips when they were about to infuse a patient, it could actually basically turn back some of these issues that uh, cause problems. So in the United States alone, there's one million adverse drugs, drug events a year that are associated with uh, infusion pumps. So those are a million mistakes that are made right at the bedside. Um, and a lot of it has to do with not having all the information to make the right decision. So we decided that we needed a very smart pump, a pump that knew what patient it was connected to, a pump that could communicate with other devices and see whether there were any incompatibilities or complications, and a pump that could also communicate with the electronic medical record and see whether there is something about the patient that would make you question whether you should be giving uh, the drug at the rate that you're programming it. And of course, whenever I think of healthcare and, and implementing new technologies, I instantly think of things like the FDA. So I've got to ask, how accepting has the healthcare industry been to you? And is, are you finding that there's this realization that technology and innovation has a, an important role in healthcare, or is there a resistance to change? What, what kind of thing are you experiencing there? Well, we're experiencing a little bit of both. First yeah. of all, um, there is there is such a need, as I said, uh, a lot of this technology was developed over 20 years ago, and um, the FDA has recognized that things must change, and um, we really need to evolve to really bring at least the infusion industry to a new level. So we've seen a lot of um, encouragement and acceptance there. That said, the, the job of the FDA is to make sure we do it right, we do it safely, and that we make um, the clinicians more effective. So they, uh, they have us under a microscope and they looked very closely at um, everything that we did. Um, we had to su supply thousands of hours of testing results. Um, we had to do uh, uh, all sorts of evaluations with users to make sure that um, our pump was safe and effective in all different ways. So it took us about two years once we finished our design to work through the FDA process. So some people might say that was um, 
a bad thing, but you know, if, when you look back on it um, and you look at them as your safety partners, um, I think we did it. We had a good relationship, and, and and the best product came through. So, can you also offer maybe a sense of just how far-reaching this is, and how much of a difference that you're aiming to make in healthcare? Because it's it's quite inspiring, isn't it? What you're doing here? Yeah, I I, I think that, um, and then we're just getting out into the market. I think that we're going to make a, a a big difference. Uh, like I said, if you think of the bogey that you're trying to hit as one million adverse drug events a year, there's a great opportunity there. And I've been asked by many people that, you know, what can you do, you know, so late in the process? Uh, there's There are systems today that check the ordering of drugs and make sure they're correct. Um, there are other systems within the electronic medical record that do checks. But what we do is we're all about those last two minutes before you give the drug, you know, in that last two minutes, what's really going on? And by providing the ability to look around and do these checks, these safety checks, we think that we're going to make infusions a lot safer. And what we've also found in our testing with our with many, many, many nurses is, is that nurses don't have to worry about the pump anymore. It just works. They put in a, a, a rate or a dose uh, they hit go and they get what they expect. They're not worrying about all the little uh, details that they had to in the past. Now, I'm sure you've got a long list of things that you've had to overcome over the years, but what have been your biggest challenges? And can you maybe uh, provide a few and, and also detail some how you actually overcome these challenges too? Well, when you, when you become the first to really... Uh, interoperate with other systems. You tend to be, um, you, you need to break through different certain walls. So when you're, when we show up with the uh, other vendors uh, of electronic medical records and we say we'd also want labs or we also want outcome data, um, sometimes that uh, takes a while before you can get uh, that work through and you can get those interfaces working. But once you do, of course, you have so much um, uh, better information, which is what our users want. Um, the other thing which has been really important to us is just delivering this, these infusions very smoothly. And very early on, that was what we wanted to make sure we did uh, perfectly well, because today, a lot of nurses well, basically need to understand uh, fluid dynamics. They need to know where to put the bag. <laughs> they need to know how far above the, the pump the bag needs to be and how far below the pump the patient needs to be um, to get it to work correctly. So we actually did a lot to make sure that we worked um, perfectly under all clinical conditions. And, uh, we made a huge investment there. Finally, um, and you know, people don't appreciate this. People look at the iPhone and say, Oh, look at this, so simple. There must be some smart use UI engineers there. Well, really, what, what they did and what we did is we spent a lot of time with our users, and we uh, set up a usability lab, and we um, had them use our pump, and if they made a mistake, we changed it. We changed it and changed it and changed it to the point that when you look at our solution, you say, wow, this is really, really simple. Um, but it took thousands of hours of, of test to get it to, the, to where we are today. So what's next for you and your team? I understand you're probably limited on the kind of information you can share, but is there anything you can share with me uh, about the future and the kind of things that you're working on? Well, it, to, to me, it's, it's all about um, getting more information. Uh, I mentioned, uh, for example, lab results. That's a type of information we want to continue to drink into the pump in provide that to our users as, um, as we go along. Um, you know, for example, if you're giving someone um, a heparin, heparin thins the blood. So wouldn't you want to know how thin the blood was before you gave, uh, you know, another administration of heparin? Uh, there's many things like that. There are drugs that speed up the heart rate or um, reduce the blood pressure almost immediately. And what would happen if it was already too high or the blood pressure was already too low? Uh, so we're focusing on those things and how we can help um, improve the decisions that people are making. Because we believe that with good information, you're going to get uh, good decisions.
and that's the path that we're going down. And for anybody listening, in particular the medical community as well, if if they want to find out more information or they've got additional questions that they'd like to talk with you about, can you just remind them of where they can find you guys online and the best way of contacting your team? Sure. Um, well, we're we're Ivenix, so we're at www.ivenix.com, um, and you can direct uh, any question to us through that website. If you want to reach out to me directly, you can do it through LinkedIn um, at LinkedIn slash in slash George W. Gray. Excellent. Well, I'll add all those links to the blog post that will accompany this podcast episode over on my website, techblogwriter.co.uk. But I love the work that you're doing here and solving real problems. And a lot of the areas that we've discussed today are things that people just don't think about and just how much they're influenced by technology. So a huge thank you for coming on and sharing that story with me today. Thank you. And thank you for having me. I cannot thank George enough for coming on the show today and changing how I look at every single piece of hospital equipment when I find myself in the one now, which hopefully isn't too often, of course. Because I think we've all been in a hospital, we've heard those beeps, but how many of you have thought about the vulnerabilities? And George is responsible for overseeing all research and development activities, as well as user experience design and testing at iVenix. And I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. But now I would like you to join the discussion about why cybersecurity and interoperability are critical to device security and how connected devices present an enormous security risk to hospitals and medical centres. So wherever you are in the world listening to this episode today, I'd love for you to share your insights, your expertise in this area. And not only with me, but with the listeners too. So please email me techblogwriter at outlook.com, tweet me at Neil C. Hughes, or pop by my website, techblogwriter.co.uk. So I'm sorry I left you for a few days, but rest assured, it's business as usual now. So prepare your podcast feeds for an influx of content this week. But a big thank you for bearing with me and for being the heart and soul of this daily tech podcast. Peace and love to you all. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.